Let me get started. First chart. I'm going to tell you a little bit about business a bit in terms of the backdrop before I get into specifically sort of what's affecting uh, a lot of what goes on from an employee perspective. I'm also going to talk a lot about Oracle as a user, and I'm going to talk less about products. I'm going to talk a lot about the dynamics that we see affecting the marketplace, and this is the first one. The fact is, and let me make sure I calibrate you on this chart because there's a lot of numbers and a lot of lines. Um, first, this chart starts in 2008, and it goes through 2015. The red line is meant to indicate the revenue growth of the S&P Standard & Poor's 500. So these are the fundamentally the 500 biggest companies in the US. And what that says is that over this period of time, there is really no revenue growth. So revenue is 1%. So let me just try to shorten that up. That's bad. Not a lot of revenue growth for the S&P 500. During that same time frame, it says that earnings are actually up. So earnings are up more like 5%. Now, without taking you back to grad school, if revenue is a little less than 1% growth and earnings is a little more than 5% growth, what does it mean are happening to expenses? They are going down. Okay, so before you go any farther, this is not you know, somebody from uh, prognosticating. This is what's happened. This is what we've been living through since basically this uh, crash in 2008. A lot of stock market improvement, but almost all of that improvement in the stock market has come from the expansion of multiples, driven by earnings, not driven by revenue, driven by lower expense structures. Anybody who says, I have no clue what this guy just said. Everybody roughly with me? It's an important backdrop as I sort of paint the picture of, of what we're all up against. All right, next chart. Now, I'm not going to talk about IT a lot. But I want you to get the backdrop of what's happening. So if you sit anywhere in HR, I'm sure none of you feel this, but have you ever had a great project and said, we should get this funded? Somebody says, nah, we don't have the money. But has that ever happened? OK, well, here it is. This, I, now, I've changed. Let me make sure I'm clear with you. I've changed things a bit here. I've now not gone. I, I, so if somebody tweets, the guy changed the format. He did. I took 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and all I did, I went from the S&P 500, and I moved to global. So the two changes I made. I changed the time frame, shortened it, and I went from the S&P 500 to global, and I looked at global IT spending growth rates. And by the way, these are not perfect. They're, they're, they're emblematic of what's transpired. So don't take them as accounting exact. And it doesn't mean it's happened this way in every country, in every industry, in every company. But overall, we've seen 5% growth in 2011 to what I would describe as flat for the next three years in a row. Flat to probably down a little bit. And of course, because overall expenses we know are down. The, think the thinking that IT is immune to that would be naive. And this year, again, the prognostication, and this year being the end of 2015, which will just now be being reported roughly at this time frame. Because the predictive firms, they, these guys that predict are really good at talking about what's happened. Not as good about what's going to happen, but really good after it's over. Negative five, negative four percent. So that would just give you some context. Now, if you don't understand the implication of that, let me try to understand, or let me try to describe what that means. IT spending globally is a couple of trillion dollars. So just as we get through sort of the, the magnitude of this, worldwide GDP, you woke up this morning, I'm sure you looked it up, $75 uh, trillion. That's all 
of commerce around the planet, 75 trillion. IT is 3% of that, 2 trillion. Half is consumer and half is all of us. The consumer spend only a few years ago was a couple of hundred billion, I'd say a few years ago, more than a decade ago, and has scaled up to a trillion in basically a dozen years. It's not exactly right, but it's close enough for the sake of what we're doing. This is company spend. All of our employees, we're going to talk about them in a second, are scaling and investing in IT like crazy. Us as companies, not so much. So just so you have that backdrop, this is a really flattish picture with most of the money being spent on keeping the existing applications running. And now a decline. Next chart. Let me go back one chart. Let me go back. I want to make one more point. And I shorten this up. If I had more time before, because I, I got other subjects I want to cover, I would explain to you that well, I'm not, I wouldn't. I'm going to do it now. Most budgets um, are about 83 4% maintenance, meaning you had a budget for IT, and you want to get something done. Let me tell you what's going on in this, in this budget. About 83 4% on average is done just to keep the existing infrastructure running. You got 15 16% eligible for new ideas. You come in with a new idea. At the same time somebody says, hey, we might get hacked. Let's put more money in security. We have regulators. Let's put more money in compliance. Somebody else has another idea. It's all of those ideas are vying for that 15 16% flattish to slightly down spend. So if you sit there and wonder why you can't get a project funded, that's it. Overall expenses are down. Compliance, regulatory, and security is up, vying for a small percentage of a very small discretionary budget. And then next chart. And the CEOs are typically very worried. CEOs, you all know this. I mean, last on average, not too long, which I take, I take personally. Uh, but it's, it's a four and a half year run on average. Four and a half year run. So measured in quarters, do you know how many quarters that would be? Anybody here? The four and a half years? 18 quarters. I'm, I'm speeding this up. Hey, I wait, I'm looking at the Oracle folks. Anybody know four and a half? I have no idea. Yeah, eight, eight. That's sort of the reaction I'm getting. Don't call on me. 18, 18 quarters and you're done. So now when you get moving, you don't have a lot of time. And remember, there's no revenue growth on average, and guess what the investor wants? Ken, what does the investor want? More money, yes, that's very good. It's our head of investor relations, right? It's more money, I want more earnings, I want more money, I want more cash flow. Somebody says, hey, I got a big idea, let's do a new project. Let's do an HR transformation. That's one idea, it's one idea, but if somebody has an idea that might give me a shorter term return, might give me more revenue growth, might give me some breathing room, that's what I'm gonna do. So in general, what's the playbook look like? Cut expenses, be tight on expenses, give me some breathing room on cash flow and earnings, take the discretionary dollars I got and invest some of that in revenue growth. And if I'm lucky, I get breathing room on both sides. I get a lower expense structure, a little bit of revenue growth, I grow earnings, and I can stay ahead of the activist posse who's chasing me for performance. Now, I could tell you things are a lot more noble than that, but they're really not. That's the bulk of the S&P 500. That's the problem set you have when we as a group talking about HR say, hey, let's do some innovative things, and you've got to sell through everything I just So everything I just said for the last 10 minutes has been to tell you that's the environment we're trying to work within and trying to work through. Everybody with me? Those who are not either confused or hostile, hand raise. Okay, this is good. I'm gonna take that as, as, as general agreement. All right, next, next chart. 
I'm going to go through this quickly because I took too much time on the upfront stuff. Engaged employees are the key to success. And I just read what's at the bottom of the chart. Not incredibly insightful to all of you, but the definition of engagement is, well, let me say it differently. Engagement drives productivity. One way to beat the chart I described earlier, as opposed to cutting expenses, is to drive higher productivity, meaning you get more output for the same investment. Most of you know that the metric on employee engagement, I should ask our team here, but nobody wants to be called on. But if you get to an industry average of 70% sort of employee engagement, how much productivity is available to you if you can drive that engagement level higher? And that really is the math. If average is 70, and I'm not going to hear to pick on because there are a lot of people below that, there's some above it. But if I can get employee engagement up to 75, by the way, I didn't gain five points, I gained seven to eight percent. What does that mean? Let me explain to you as, as somebody who's very involved. It means my expenses went down by seven to eight percent. Instead of cutting the expenses, I drove more productivity. And I drove more productivity by driving higher levels of engagement. So let me go back one more time to, to say, I don't think of this totally as a noble exercise. I think of this as sound business. This is how you drive performance. Higher engaged employees, they do more work. They do better work. They care more about the results of the business. They care more about are your customers. They perform better and so does the entire entity. Engagement is the key to productivity. Next chart. By the way, let me go back. Let me go back one chart. If, I'm sorry about that, but I want to make sure I make one more point. If we can't get that thought process ingrained into the leadership, then we have, that's where our problems break down. If I look at employee base as an expense structure, and turn, as opposed to a productivity machine that can drive output, then everything else we're going to talk about falls apart. So if I simply say, the more employees I have, the worse. As opposed to the higher engagement I have, the better. All of the fundamental thesis of engagement, productivity, and eventually performance go out the window. Next chart. I want to go into a little bit. Of, this, is, this is my confession chart. I uh, used to get all this stuff about millennials. Have you, you guys ever heard this thing? This millennials are very different and unique, and they're changing consumer expectations. The millennials buy differently. They think differently. They're more entitled. They, they're not loyal. They want to jump jobs all the time. They want all this job flexibility, and they care more about that than they do pay, and, and, and all of these stuff. And by the way, I read tons of this. I'm going to give you a lot more about this data because obviously, it, well, not obviously, we at Oracle are huge, huge hirer, and millennials are a huge part of our employee base. Data, I'm going to tell you here, doesn't support this. It doesn't support it. It supports that there are some differences, and I'll explain those to you in a second, but all generations adopt the technologies available to them at about the same rate. All are looking for respect and recognition at work. All care about career development. And I'm going to talk to you more about that in a second. But if you ask me, and by the way, I'm sure you're shocked, I'm in the baby boomer generation. And, and if somebody said to me, do you care about career development today? Yeah, I'd be like, well, I mean, in, in terms of myself, I don't have many places to go. I'm on that clock I described earlier, so... You know, somebody could come in and talk to me. The board could have a session with me about my personal career development. It, it's it's going to get one set of reactions for me. But if you'd asked me 30 years ago, I'd have given you a completely different answer. 
So these surveys are, I find them interesting, but I don't find them fascinating. Next, next, next chart. Let me tell you about Oracle. First, to a large degree, you're here at this conference talking about Oracle as a, a partner um, who's going to bring to you a whole set of HCM capabilities. And I'm glad, I'm thrilled you're here. I'm thrilled the room is packed. There are people in the back. I hope you don't have a fire marshal problem. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. That said, we're more than just a supplier or a partner who delivers technology. We're a consumer of talent. We're a huge hiring machine. And at the same time, we're becoming an incredible researcher of that employee base. We have roughly 140,000 employees. 38% of our employee base are now millennials. Sort of, I want to say one more time, 38% of our employee base are now millennials. A huge part of our employee base, 44% are Gen X, and the baby boomer group is actually the smallest uh, part of our employee base, 18%. We're very diverse globally. You can see the statistics, only 40% of our employees sit in North America. We're hiring 20,000 uh, people a year. We're growing the company. I, when I came to the company, which is you know, 2010, we had a little, little roughly 90,000 employees, 91, 92,000 employees. So you can get the context of the growth we've had from an employee perspective just over the last uh, period of time. Now, we obviously, like all of you, do have attrition, so we have to backfill. Uh, employees that, that, that leave the company or move from the company, uh, and we're growing seven, 8,000 net jobs per year. We hire 20,000 people, a lot of people. By the way, just to be clear, we interview over 60,000 people here. Think about it, just interview them. Sit down and say, hi, tell me about yourself. Just as a process alone is a very difficult process. We take over half a million resumes into the company. So somebody has to go through all those resumes, then decide here's who we're going to interview, and then eventually who to hire. And I'll talk to you more about that in a second. We have over 3,000 college hires per year. Doesn't sound like much until you multiply it by multiple years, and all of a sudden we have 15,000 college graduates in the company that are out over the last four to five years. And we talk to them. These are big ideas, okay? Let's ask you, not just about Oracle, but ask you how you think, how you buy, how you work, and let's compare. Next chart. This is what they say. By the way, this is statistically significant. So I, I didn't call together like four people. Hey, what do you think? You guys, well, you know, I don't know. This is, we went out to 60,000 people and did it year after year after year. Same group, same questions. By the way, any, all of you know when you do research, the more you can have the consistent end being the same and have the same questions. If you change questions, the data set and the analytics begin to, to, to move on you. So you ask a question you know, about generational engagement. Who's more engaged? Because you know, millennials, myth, they're not that engaged. It's not what we found. It's not what we found. They're a slightly more engaged than the rest of our population. By the way, at 1%, you have at least 2 to 3% room for error in the survey. So it may be the exact same. I would say, by the way, one of the key takeaways I take from this chart is there really is no difference. You ask them when they leave. And I, I'm sure you find this. I'll make a confession. We actually have some people that leave. Were you less engaged or more engaged than Gen X people that leave? No. Gen X people, you can see here, were 2%, two points. It's actually points here, not percent, but two points relative to the base. I didn't show you the base. I didn't want to do that for competitive reasons, but our employee base, think of it on a survey, is a, a, in general a little more engaged than peer group. We start a little higher than the peer group, and these are the deltas relative to that, which is all you know, the bigger the company, the harder it is to get differentiated from, 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 from the peer group. Virtually identical. Next chart. 
This is when, and by the way, think of us asking lots and lots of questions and getting lots and lots of answers. And all this was to show you the degree of differences at different points on different subjects between millennials and non-millennials. Career development. Millennial very interested in career development, non-millennial interested. But it follows logic. The longer you're in it, the, the more career you have left, the more interested I am in career development. I think it makes sense. Rewards, gee, I'm interested in rewards. So is non-millennials. And we've got back to this authority and speed. I would say we saw a few deltas. If I were to look for anything differently, it was this view that millennials sort of uh, uh, are want more flexibility. If anything, if anything, we see the opposite in our surveys. We want to move faster. We want to see less bureaucracy. We want to make decisions faster. We want to have authority pushed further down in the organization. I looked at all of that as really good. Really good. And frankly, about my performance, I want more clarity. I want more feedback. I don't see these as huge generational differences. I see these as fundamentally, well, the fundamentals of driving engagement in workforce pretty much the same as they've always been. Let's talk about that. HR as a process, it isn't an application. It isn't one thing. It's a series of things that have to get done to drive engagement. Starting with, and I already started about the massive process, and I'll stick with us for a second, that we have to recruit and hire. So if you just looked at it as a quantity issue, you know, our CHRO and, and her team have the job, massive job of recruiting and hiring. We have an, we have an advanced strategy, and I, I say this a lot, that we just can't get away with hiring just 20,000 people. We actually have to hire 20,000 good people. I just made the problem harder. 20,000 good people who can succeed at Oracle. And it'd be really helpful if I understood how people succeed at Oracle, what makes them likely to succeed at Oracle, and I can feed that into the recruitment process. My likelihood for success goes way up. I then have to bring them in, and then we have to, as a team, train them. We have to onboard them, simple things. We have to get them a badge. We have to get them, a, uh, we have to get them connected to the network. We have to get them engaged, but then we have to train them. Most of the people we hire don't know anything about our company. We have to assimilate them. A massive job to bring them through the process, hire them, onboard them, assimilate them, train them, and prepare them to go to battle. Prepare them to develop, prepare them to sell, prepare them to market, prepare them to support. We have to do all that work, and frankly, we have to do it well, and we have to do it fast. And once we do it, we have to integrate them into our, I'll call it a machine for the lack of a better word, and then we have to get them to help the machine perform. Which means what? We have to engage them. Back to the whole, we have to engage them to drive them to perform. And by the way, remember what engagement is? Engagement drives performance, performance drives expense structures, expense structures drives revenue and cash flow. So again, if, I, I don't want to confuse anybody. If anybody here thinks, what a, I know, I know no one's thinking this, but just to make sure I illuminate it, you think, what a noble thought process. This is not noble. This is about how to drive businesses. Get the, the team with the best talent for their business model typically wins. And if I can get the best people, get them trained, get them performed, get them engaged, we win. Once we drive performance, we have to recognize and reward them. And I say this all the time, and I, 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 I like the comments the, the, the speaker just made who was here. When you recognize and reward somebody, when you promote somebody, we do the same thing. We tell every employee what we value. And when, we, when, we, when I promote somebody, it's so important that I explain why. If I say why because they're politically good, they say nice things to me, then everybody will say nice things to me. 
If I say because they changed a customer relationship, they did something extraordinary, people will try to do extraordinary things. It's so important we message and reinforce what it is we do to try to drive performance and what we value in the drive for that engagement and performance. Continue to build skills and experiences, move people around organizations, and align them. We all know eventually organizations continue to progress up, but a big part of our workforce is not everybody in our company wants to be CEO. Not everybody in our company wants to be an executive vice president. A big part of our company are tenured employees who like their jobs, by the way, and they're good at their jobs. And we all have the issue of experienced employees who've been in our companies a while and the risk of them getting stagnant. And the role for us as leaders to make sure they stay inspired, they seem motivated, even though they may not be as motivated by promotions hierarchically as others might. So this whole issue to move and align and drive performance all feeds back once I understand that model through, anal through deep, deep analytics into my recruiting and hiring process. What drives performance? Where did I source that employee? How did I train that employee? Who did that employee work for? Remember, I believe, to the core, we have the issue in our company. We have all of our employees work for about 14,000 managers. Most of our employees through see Oracle through the lens of the manager they work for. I can give a speech and say whatever I want to the employee base, but half hour later, I'm back to that relationship with my manager. And training and preparing that manager to drive this model, getting homogeneous behavior from that first level management, as big an issue as anyone that any of us has in driving overall engagement and performance out of our workforce. Next chart. We use our own stuff. I'm sure this is shocking to you, but we actually use our own technology. And the reason I tell you this is, is that if you think about working with Oracle, it's important you know that we're on the same journey you're on. We're trying to drive engagement. We're trying to drive performance. I don't look at HR as an application. I look at it as one of the most complex processes that exists in the corporate world. And it touches every single thing we do. And I have good news or bad news for you. It's not your process. You that are in HR, it's the company's process. It's the company's lifeblood. It drives the company. So for us, this is as much for us driving functionality and capability broad holistic process capability into all of this functionality. We've got to have a fantastic recruiting capability. We have to know our employees inside out. The pressure on, frankly, to be honest with you, on, on our CHRO, on Joyce, is because I want to know how to engage our workforce. I have an insatiable need for analytics, the corollaries between how and why. Because if I can get that number up, let's take the peer group number of 70%. If I can just get seven more points, I have a, nothing you couldn't read in a public document, we have a $20 billion expense structure. Can you take 10% of 20 billion? Uh, can you do that, ML? 10% of 20, two billion, two, that's right, exactly right. I get $2 billion, that's how I think of it. I get engagement higher. So again, I gotta feed this back into the entire process. And we have 2,000 developers. I wanna make sure I say this again. The, the group we have that Bill's and Chris Leone's group of uh, our development organization is 2,000 developers. By the way, these aren't the operations people. These aren't, these are people that come to work every day to feature string and extend uh, our application set, dedicated to HCM Cloud SaaS. Doesn't mean, by the way, for those of you that are here that are PeopleSoft customers, we're gonna maintain that PeopleSoft base for years to come. I know not everybody is ready to jump into the cloud. 
and we'll be there to make sure we maintain that base you know, out into the future uh, as well. Next chart. Let me tell you why I think this cloud thing is, um, is, is sort of irresistible, and I'm gonna end on this. Um, there's very few things that you get in business that cost less, that are less complicated, that actually drive more innovation for you at the same time. This doesn't come around again. You're gonna hear this cloud thing over and over again. And the reason, remember that first chart or the first set of charts I showed you about the expense structure. There's very few opportunities to spend less, get computers out of your data center, get license fees out of your data center, get people out of your data centers, get rid of the, uh, uh, the cooling, get rid of all that cost structure and just get software over the network. By the way, remember all those meetings any of you have going to the IT community saying, hey, can we revisit that HR transformation work? And those painful meetings where the guy says, sure, and you never hear back. Those meetings are over because now there's 2,000 programmers working every day to drive that for you. They are now your IT staff. Your innovation level goes up, two to three releases a year, three to 400 features per release. And by the way, you got at the, you can join our advisory board, help us drive the feature stringing, and you can sit there with us. Because the number one pusher on the advisory board is Joyce and me. Because of the functionality we have to drive our global workforce and our holistic view to drive engagement. This is an irresistible force. Doesn't mean you have to go today, but as you move forward, costs go down, innovation goes up. You get to push the work from somebody, uh, uh, from your IT staff to somebody else, and that somebody else is us. And you're gonna hear, I think as you go through, if you ever hear about security, one of the biggest issues here is it's actually more secure. You get the most secure environment. All of our data is encrypted. You're gonna hear this term, somebody says, encrypted at rest, which means we encrypt the data while it sits on a piece of storage. Let me make sure I tell you, anybody who says the words encrypted at rest knows nothing about security. That is the same security you have on your PC. You need to encrypt across the network line or you're at risk. Fully encrypted, fully secured, fully patched, the most secure environment in the world. That is why this will happen. And Oracle's strategy has been to provide all layers of the cloud. Not, and remember with HR, HR is a suite of applications and to provide suites across all functions. And you're gonna find more and more, I want HR applications that work with financial applications. And Oracle's capability to provide all of that suite uh, together.